Thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. I know several people and it's wonderful to see you. Um, the people I know and it's wonderful to see the people that I don't know. And it's wonderful to see the names of people who are not showing their faces, but it's so wonderful to have you here. So um, I guess I was sort of around at the beginning of Empty Gate Zen Center because I used to, I got my PhD from Berkeley and I would come back in the summers to do research. And um, so I would, I, I started practicing Zen in Cambridge in um, 1970, when 1976. And um, I went back to Berkeley uh, in 77, and I forget what happened, but then in 1978, I went back to Berkeley in the summer to practice, and I was at Berkeley Zen Center, the Soto place, to practice, because that's the only place I knew to practice. And suddenly this guy shows up in Korean robes. And it was Stephen Mitchell back when he was a monk, you know. And I go up to him and I say, whoa, what are you doing here? And he said, uh, don't you know there's a, there's a place up in the hills that this couple, Diana and Ezra, um, you know, have a little center there. And I said, oh, that's great. So I went up there and I started practicing there and I spent, um, I actually spent the summer there. And um, I want to tell one story from this. This was before Arch Street. This was a really long time ago. And um, so Zen Master Sung San was visiting. And back in 1978, if a Zen master was in town, this was a really big deal and people came out of the woodwork. Now, you know, there's Zen centers and every uh, Zen masters on every street corner in Berkeley and even in a couple of street corners in Lawrence, Kansas. So it's not such a big deal. But back then it was a really big deal. So Zen master Sung Sun was in town and he was giving a talk at um, at this, you know, house way high up in the hills that was sort of this impromptu Zen center. And this guy shows up for this talk who's, um, he's very scary. He's sitting in the back row and there's this weird energy. And there weren't all these mass shootings back then, but I would not have been surprised if he like take, took him out of, you know, taken out an AK-47 and started spraying everyone with bullets. So he had that kind of very frightening energy. And he asked this sort of hostile question of Zen Master Sung San with this very weird energy. And Zen Master Sung San looked at him and he said, right now, you a little crazy, but you come back when you're not so crazy. And you could just see the guy relax. And that was very interesting because, you know, I would think if you call someone crazy, who really is crazy, whatever crazy means, you know, then they would explode or something. But this guy, he just like relaxed. And I thought that was very interesting and admirable on the part of Zen Master Sung San. And at the time, what I thought was that his naming the situation was the thing that had eased this man's mind. And much later when my mother-in-law was in early stage Alzheimer's and she was living with us and I found her upstairs in the kitchen and she was this very elegant woman, but she was disheveled. You know, her clothes were all askew and she has this frightened look in her eyes. She says, I don't know where I am. Where am I? Where am I? And I said to her, oh, you have Alzheimer's. And she said, oh, I have Alzheimer's. And she relaxed. So I thought that was that what that was about. But now I don't think that that was what what that was about. So I'm going to skip forward a long time, not that long, about maybe five or six years later, I was, uh, yeah, about five or six years later, I was doing a solo retreat in this place uh, in Massachusetts called Temenos. And it was in a, the Temenos is a sort of retreat center. They have these little solo cabins and then they have kind of a lodge where groups can meet and um, it was run by, founded by Quakers. And uh, the cabin I was in was actually built by Link Rhodes, who's one of the Jido Pops and Nims in our school. Um, one of Zen, Zen and Esther Sung San's oldest students. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was in this cabin there and um, 
this was long before cell phones. So, you know, I was going to be there for 21 days and I had to keep track of the days. I couldn't pull out my cell phone and look at the days because we didn't have cell phones. And so I was going to keep a journal. Fine. You know, every day I'd write in my journal and I wouldn't just like put like a mark because then I couldn't remember like, did I put a mark today or not? Is that today's mark or yesterday's mark? It can't be tomorrow's mark, but you know, so I had to write something every day to, so I'd remember that that was the day I'd written something. And uh, first I was writing, 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 writing. I was just writing all these long things about my thoughts and my feelings and, you know, how my practice was going and all this, you know, blah, 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 just all this stuff, just doing all this writing, 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 writing. And then around day three or four, I realized, wait a minute, that stuff's not real. All the stuff you're writing down, you're just solidifying something that's not actually real. You're making something up and then you're encasing it in concrete. And how can you ever cut through your thinking that way? And so I stopped and instead I have one phrase, you know, two goldfinches, red nude on path. You know, that kind of thing. Just one thing. So I'd remember, okay, I wrote something that day. I'd understand what day the date was was associated with, and that was it. So then after that retreat, I went to see my brother who lived nearby. And, um, you know, I took a nice hot shower and everything, and then we went out for beer and pizza and what do you, that's what you do after a retreat, right? So, you know, we went out for beer and pizza and we're sitting in the restaurant and he said, well, what was your retreat like? So I told him about this experience of writing down, you know, all this stuff about what I was thinking and feeling and how my practice was going and, you know, was it good or bad or, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I said, but then I stopped because I realized that I'm just making something up, that that's not my true self. That's not who I really am. That's just this manufactured thing. And he looked at me very puzzled. And he said, if you're not your thoughts and your feelings, then who are you? That's a good question, (laughs) you know? So yeah, if we're not our thoughts and our feelings, then who are we? So in the Heart Sutra, which we just chanted, they list the sense organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind. The mind is listed as a sense organ. So I'm looking at Jeff, And I see his white beard and his brown casa and his gray sweater, robe, whatever it is. (laughs) And the green plant behind him and whatever. But I don't think that I made his beard, that I am his beard, that I am his casa, that I am his sweater or the plant. I don't think that the green, the white, the brown, the gray, I don't think those are mine, that that defines me. And I have earbuds in because my husband's post COVID and he has that lingering cough and I didn't want to inflict it on you guys. And when I hear him cough, I don't think that that's cough is me that I made this cough, that this cough defines me. And when I touch my computer, which is this very smooth metal, you know, and a little bit cold because it's metal, or the other hand, I touch my face, which is warmer and a kind of softer consistency to it, I would hope. I don't think that this surface of this computer that I'm feeling is something that is intrinsically defining me 
or that the feeling of my skin is intrinsically defining me, my basic being. But somehow, when we perceive these thoughts, we think that's who we are. So that's very interesting. That's kind of nuts. You know, these thoughts arise and we grab onto them and we say, that's me, that's me, that's me. So I think that this guy, that Zen Master Sung San, um, sort of, what's the word I want, uh, sort of um, relaxed. I think what he heard was not the crazy part, but right now, you're a little crazy. Right now. The way you feel, the way you are in the moment does not define you. Right now, you come back when you're not so crazy. So that's what I think was really going on. This realization, oh, right now. Maybe sometime not the same, you know? So before I practice Zen, um, I was deeply, deeply, deeply disturbed. I, um, now I don't like to use the word crazy because it's very pejorative and but, um, you know, I was a little bit delusional. I was extremely anxious. I was extremely angry. I was somewhat suicidal. Um, I was very self-absorbed. I, I had eating disorders. I mean, I, I was kind of messed up. And um, that's when I started meditation, actually, re relaxation response, because I just had to grab something. And I had this amazing therapist. She was a gestalt therapist. And I've told um, Richard Schrobe, Zen Master Wu Kuang, is also a gestalt therapist. And I told him stories about Mila, um, my therapist, and he just laughs because I think they're miracles. And he says, I do that every day. <laughs> you know? But um, so I went through all this gestalt therapy. And the thing about gestalt therapy, it's not really like talk therapy because it's more like koans. You kind of hit it from the side and other angles and you kind of cut through it. You don't go directly. For example, I once told Mila a dream I had. I never remembered dreams, but I remembered a dream. I was very excited. I go tell Mila, I had this dream. And she's so wonderful. Tell me your dream. And I said, I'm walking on this road. And she says, tell, tell, what's it like to be the road? And I said, Mila, Mila, that's not what the dream is about. I'm walking on this road, you know, I'm walking on this road. She says, no, no, no. Tell me what the road, what it's like to be the road. And then I said, okay, all right. So I'm walking on this road. I mean, I, I am the road and people are walking on me and I guess I'm made of something like asphalt and I'm kind of gray and no one notices me and everybody's walking on me and nobody, you know, and I start dissolving into tears, right? If I told her what I thought the dream was about, that never would have happened. But it's very much like cons. You know, does the dog have inner nature? Can't say yes, you can't say no. You have to cut through it. So that's how Gestalt works. Um, anyway, I went through like two years with uh, Mila Hoffman. And um, then one day I just looked at her and I said, I don't have to be this way, do I? And she said, no, you don't. And it lifted. If you've ever seen a tornado lift, it just lifted that kind of disturbance that I was always going through. It was gone, which doesn't mean, I mean, I still get angry and anxious and unhappy and everything else, but that kind of basic disturbance, you know, in my core, that was gone. That was just gone. So it doesn't have to be that way. It's like this world, as Unman said, this world is vast and wide. Then Unman went on to say, why do you put on the sevenfold robe? But I'm just going to say this world is vast and wide. 
Why do we make all this stuff and obscure the view? There's this, um, this image that's used a lot in the Mahayana called the city of the Gandharvas. So the Gandharvas are a kind of minor deity and they're all men, they're all male. But anyway, the city of the Gandharvas. And the thing about the city of the Gandharvas is you look at it and you think it's real. But then as the sun comes up and shines and shines and shines on the city, and you begin to see in the light that the city doesn't exist. It's just a mirage. So when we hold on to our thoughts, what we're really doing is holding on to the city of the Gandharvas. And it's actually not there. This does not define who we are. It's this don't know mind, this don't know mind, which doesn't lock things in, which is open and free. Happy things come, happy. Sad things come, sad. You know, it's not like this world is this beautiful jewel palace. This world is filled with all kinds of suffering and all kinds of joy. But it is exactly what it is. We don't have to create a narrative about it to cause ourselves and others even more suffering. We can see things as they are. We don't have to identify and hold. We can say, oh, it doesn't have to be that way. So. It doesn't have to be that way. Thank you.